Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan Myers. Um, I will be your moderator uh, for this uh, for this discussion on how to do DNI on a budget. Um, I am a talent acquisition partner, um, also the co-lead of our Black ERG, which is the Connectors of Black Excellence at Connect RN, which is a health tech company um, heck, um, here in uh, Massachusetts. And now, what I'd like to do is introduce our amazing panelists that will help me with this discussion. Uh, first, we have Amy Flynn, who is a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant for Insperity, as well as we have Sonia Mack, who is a director of diversity, equity, and inclusion services at Insperity as well. So now what we're going to do is before we begin our discussion, what we'd like to do is we actually have some poll questions that we'd like for the audience that's in person, as well as the audience virtually um, to answer. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the polls for you guys to answer those, and that will help with facilitating this discussion as well. So the first question that we'd like everyone to answer is, out of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, which one is the most important to you or your organization at this time? You can answer that. Okay. I'll just give everyone a little one more minute and then I'll move on to the second. Okay, so it seems like we have belonging is first, inclusion is second, and diversity is third. And we didn't get any votes in how for equity, but that's okay. <laughs> so now it's okay, but they're all important equally. Okay, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to we're going to actually poll the audience on the second question, which is. How much flexibility do you have to create your diversity, equity, inclusion, or belonging strategy at your organization? 100% flexibility, more flexibility than not, not very flexible, or no flexibility at all? Interesting. Okay. So it looks like for this question, it seems like it's very close. We have seven votes for more flexibility than not. And then, then following by 100 flex, 100 flexibility. And then not very flexible. So it seems like it's very close within the two. Great. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So thank you guys so much for participating in those poll questions. We do appreciate it. And so now what we're going to do is actually going to get into the discussion. And so um, what we're going to do is first, we think that it's very important before we even talk about DEI B on a budget to talk about what is diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. 
think it's very important that we have that understanding of what these words mean and kind of what they represent. And so what I'd love to do is open it up to Amy first and to just kind of talk about kind of what is diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and how to impact and support your organization. Amy? Great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for, for being here with us today. We're so happy to, to be here. And thank you, Jonathan, for the, for the great first question. I think it is so important to be able to define and understand these terms. I know that sometimes they may be used interchangeably um, in different cases and spaces. So to be able to kind of come together on, on this is, a, I think, a great first step. And it was interesting to me to see that the poll showed that belonging is something that people want to hear more about. Um, to me, that's, that's really the ultimate place where you want to be. It's what you aspire to. It's what you um, hopefully want to have your organization really be all about. Um, so I'll get to that in a moment. But I, I want to start with diversity, right? So the D in the D-E-I-B is really about, it's about representation, right? So it's about who's literally there, who's in the room, uh, what voices are, are present, um, and what types of backgrounds and varied ex um, uh, just experiences are people bringing. And it really does relate to, I mean, diversity is, is large. It's, it's, more than, um, it's more than gender, it's, it's more than race, but those are very, obviously very important and in the forefront. Um, it's also about our abilities, you know, um, physical abilities and visible disabilities. It's about uh, you know, sexual orientation, gender identity. It's about our religion, socioeconomic status. It's about our parental status and um, our geography, even where we are from, um, all comes into play. I think our, um, our personality styles in a sense as well. So it's, it's, it's vast when we think about our dimensions of diversity. Um, and when we think about you know, what makes a strong team and what makes a strong organization, I think a lot of it comes back to having varied experiences and opinions and, um, and just life, right, that people can bring. So uh, that's the D, that's about representation and representation matters, right? It matters what we see and what we um, include within our organizations. And then um, E is really our equity. So uh, this is one that I know we hear a lot. We, we, can, we get the equity confused with equality sometimes. Um, equality is when everything is the same, right? Everyone is given the same thing, the same tools and the same, um, um, you know, just plan, really. When you think about equity, it's what people need to be successful. It's providing access in many different ways so that people are able to have a similar outcome. And that's really what equity is. And that's important when you think about your organizations and how you can be sure that all of your employees um, have equitable um, you know, uh, situations. And then we're gonna be thinking about inclusion and what inclusion is. And um, this is what the word might sound like. It's being included, it's including all People. It's including all of your employees um, and really celebrating their differences and again their different experiences and backgrounds and, and valuing that and inviting people to be a part of the conversation and having people not just you know allowed to you know be a part of a meeting but valuing their and respecting their thoughts and their opinions and giving the space for that. Um, it's thinking about all that you do through that lens um, and really, really, um, again, celebrating that and being intentional about it. We're going to talk a lot about that. You're going to hear that word a lot today, I think. <laughs> um, intentionality, because that's the, I think, the driver behind all of this work. And then the B. So the B is belonging. And uh, we're hearing more and more about B, about belonging, which makes sense because that's the ultimate place, right? Um, that's where people feel that they can, you hear this term, maybe bring themselves, their whole selves to work. But it's true. It's bringing their whole selves, all of their backgrounds, all of that make them individuals and make them unique and, and not feeling like they have to hide something 
are that they have to cover some aspect about their identity in order to be a part of something and be successful. It's how can we take you know, who we are um, and, and who we are as a team and really make sure that um, you know, everyone has that sense of, of belonging and connection. That's what you know. I think employees are looking for. We know this based on lots of research. Um, there's a lot of compelling evidence and, and reason for for doing this. Um, but that's where we want to where we really want to be is that sense where people have that connection. People want to stay. Then they want to stay with organizations. They want to grow with new organizations um, as well and be, and become a part of that. So important to instill that. I'd say. So that's kind of an overview. Hopefully that, um, that kind of makes sense and you're kind of in line with how we're gonna be talking about it through the session today. Thank you so much, Amy, for, for, for breaking that down. It was amazing and totally makes sense. Sonia, is there anything that you'd like to add as well? I just wanted to add in your poll question, it talked about what was a priority for your organization now. And I would encourage everyone not to try to give weight to one over the other. It takes all three, which is the D and the I, and ultimately gets us to belonging. And I like to think of it as a good song. You have to have all the notes to have a hit. So you want to have all of those pieces working together so that you can have a, um, success in your organization and progress. So I just wanted to, to add that bit to it. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's interesting that you say that because the metaphor I was thinking too is like a puzzle. You need all those pieces of the puzzle to kind of come together to make a complete picture yeah. as well. Or right. if you want to think about it, starting with a canvas, a blank canvas to create a maximum. So very mm -hmm. that point as well. Um, in terms of kind of talking about leadership, we know leadership is very, very important um, when it comes to implementing any type of DEI strategy. And so, um, Sonia, we're going to direct this question to you. Kind of, in your opinion, what is the primary role of executive senior leadership when? implementing a DEIB strategy and how should executive or senior leadership partner with their DEI council or task force committee if applicable it's very important that your senior leadership champions this effort uh, change management uh, is not going to be successful if your senior leaders aren't leading the effort. Many times we have clients who come to us and um, you have maybe representatives from their HR area or some leader in the organization has been given this as a goal, that you are to lead this effort. However, they might try to help organize the boots on the ground, if you will, but your senior leaders have a responsibility to be the voice of the effort. Um, to lead the communication around it, uh, to be a model of what that should be. So talk, making themselves vulnerable. Uh, many times you've heard about uh, wanting to have difficult conversations. I remember when George Floyd was first murdered, a lot of companies came to us like, we don't know where to start with our conversations in this space. Well, we would tell our senior leaders, you have to open that dialogue. You know, we have a lot of people, I don't know what to say. I don't know where to start. That's being vulnerable. And that's helping others in the organization really open up. So it's about your availability to lead this effort. And we know as the CEO and presidents of organizations, you may not make it you can't Im involve yourself in everything that the organization does, but you have a key role. And in the strategy, we identify where does the senior leader have a key responsibility in what they are doing as a part of the uh, embedding the strategy into the organization. So it's important that they're visible. And the second part of your question, I'm sorry, can you repeat it for me, Jonathan? Yes, yes, yes. Um, how should executive senior leadership partner with the DEI Council Task Force Committee? Thank you. Um, when you have a DEI Council or Task Force in place, it's important to have an executive sponsor that's a part of that committee or task force. That task force and commit or committee needs someone who is there to help them make decisions, to be the voice of senior leadership who can talk about where our executives are and bridge the, the gap between communication and where we need to go as an organization and what leadership, what the needs are from leadership to make that happen. So having them serve as an executive sponsor, whether it's the CEO or someone from the C-suite uh, or even a senior vice president or someone at that level, but who can make those decisions um, that can drive the effort forward. Mm -hmm. 
And so I just wanted to add too, just in thinking about my experiences too, because for the audience, so I work at a startup company, uh, which is called Connect RN. And I know one thing that we have is a DEI committee that focuses on kind of all of the initiatives for the company. And that's something that usually, you know, as an idea, and since we're kind of talking about how to do DEI and in a budget, that's something where it just takes people who are interested to kind of lead the charge and people coming together and having meetings and and doing that. And so it's really easy and simple, you know, to find people who are passionate about this type of work and can really get involved. So I just wanted to make that point as well. And may I make one more point, Jonathan? Yep. The thing that I want to, the reason why, another reason why the executive sponsor is so important, because we have to help our task force and our councils understand they are a body that are recommending work. They don't decide on what gets done for the organization. They recommend what should be done. Your senior leaders are the decision makers. So that's why, again, they're important to be a part of the discussions so we can talk about what can be done now what versus what can be done later. Because everything can't be done all at one time. So we have to be able to prioritize, and they help with that. Yes. Excellent. 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 Um, so now, as we've, we've talked about kind of, in kind of just to, Summarize. We've already talked about now diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, kind of breaking down what that means. We've now talked about executive senior leadership in terms of kind of the parts that they play when implementing DEI strategies and in terms of partnering with their council and committee. So now let's talk about mistakes, right? We know that mistakes are things that happen, mistakes are needed. With mistakes, there's lessons learned, and with that comes growth. And so um, I'm going to actually take this question on in terms of kind of what is the bis- biggest mistake that you have seen or I have seen when it comes to DE&I. And to kind of piggyback on what Sonia says, I think it's not enough conversations and dialogue in actually having and starting those uncomfortable conversations and having a platform in terms of doing that. You know, it's one thing, of course, when we have leaders talk about how important it is, and that's great. And of course, having a DEI committee or having a task list is important, but I think it's also very important that as leaders and as companies, as employees, that we really continue having these discussions, not just on a company-wide level, but also a department level as well. And I think it's sometimes when it comes to DE and IB, it kind of gets lost in the sauce, right? Because it's a lot of work. But I think when you think about like one thing that, you know, the CEO of our company says, DE and IB is everyone's responsibility. And it's very important that we try to find ways that we can continue the conversation in our daily work. And not to say that, you know, we're not having a lot of conversations because we are, like, we have a committee, we have leadership, but I think it's more on the department levels because, of course, everyone's assigned different roles and has different responsibilities, but it's like, how does DE&IB affect this department or affect my daily role with every day? And so I know that's something that I try to champion more of just when it comes to the committee and in senior leadership and just with leaders and talking about that more on a daily basis, I think it's important. Um, I don't know if Amy, you were saying like chime in on anything. Yeah, I love I love how you were talking about your daily work, right? Making sure that's embedded in, in daily work. And I think that that is a mistake sometimes that leaders can make is maybe looking at something as a as a training we're gonna do one day and say, oh, we're gonna roll out this training and everyone's gonna do this and it's gonna be great. And we're gonna have done DE and I. And there we go. Um, but really, it's thinking about how can we build it into our processes and our and our systems and the way that we work and building it into our entire employee life cycle, for example, um, thinking about, you know, how our organization really works and how can we move it into our systems. So that's one. And that really relates to the bigger the bigger question, really, of, you know, is your DEI strategy aligned with your organizational and business strategy, it's one and the same really, right? It's, you can't really have a business strategy. Uh, well, you, you, I guess you could without a DEI strategy, but it's hard to have a DEI strategy that's not embedded and aligned with your organizational goals. It really should be elevated. And we've seen that. We've, we work with a lot of organizations and, and have helped them to be able to to do this and see this from this level and from this perspective, this vantage point is really important. Um, so absolutely, as you're thinking about DE&I, it's how are we embedding this into layers, maybe even things that are already existing. It's not always recreating the wheel at every step of the way. It's how can we add in um, different you know, approaches and strategies. So 
that is could be a mistake that leaders can make. Sometimes it is, um, you know, something we know that leaders are very busy and it could be something where it's moved on, perhaps to some more junior employees. Um, honestly, sometimes it can be moved on to employees, people of color, women in the organization and say, okay, because you were part of this demographic, you can run this and you know the best way to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really, you know, not the case. You want your clear strategy, your communication and your consistent communication coming from the top. And without that, um, I think that is a, a mistake that leaders can make. Um, I, you know, other places where you can be aware of, I think, as, as leaders is making sure that um, you're taking the time to educate yourself as well, right? Really stepping into these places and learning um, and not always, um, you know, expecting others to educate you, but really taking uh, these steps, I think, is really important as well. And I think really quick, Jonathan, I was going to say, and another thing is, as a leader, ask your people. Yeah. Oftentimes, leaders are trying to make decisions without talking to their employees and getting their insight. What's your perspective on where we are as an organization? Where do you think we have opportunity? What has been your experience in our organization? So as Amy said, that communication strategy is defined from the top down so we know what conversations and what needs to be done at each level and then gathering the voices at all levels um, so that we can define what that should look like. Yeah, I think that's, you, you, both of you made excellent points and I, and I totally agree with everything you all said, so it's fantastic. Um, and I, I also, as I was thinking, as how you, as both of you were talking, you know, I think it's also important that, you know, with leaders and I know sometimes hard to do that because leaders are very busy in their day in their day to day, but to have like that open door policy in a way, in terms of wanting to have those conversations, because sometimes leaders, you know, they're focusing on one lens and DEI is the lens for everyone. And sometimes it sometimes can be a disconnect when it comes to kind of understanding what's being done in the company in regards to DEI. So I think it's also very important to have that open door policy in a way so that when it comes to communication and in terms of initiatives and what can be done that there's that there's that transparency in that as well. So I just wanted to make that point. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, so now, um, I guess, as we think about kind of DE and I, and so of course this this discussion is about DE and I and a budget. And so of course, what can you do with a budget or without a budget? And now, Sonia, I'll actually pose this question to you about kind of what can you do with a budget without a budget in that and if there are any free resources that could help support your efforts. And also, how do you think, Sonia, in terms of working with leadership teams to get budget, if there is buy-in or no buy-in? It seems that based on, you know, the poll question, and this is where this talking point was discussed, it seems like there's a lot of flexibility when it comes to leaders right now based on the poll when it comes to having a budget, whether it's 100% or there's some flexibility. So, Sonia, I'll uh, let you have that. Well, certainly if you have a budget, I encourage you to partner with a consultant that can help you. I think having a professional in your space who has a third party perspective and can bring, bring best practices to you is very important. Um, oftentimes people think there's a cookie cutter approach to this and it's really not. We meet all of our clients where they are because everyone's on a different journey. And so we customize those efforts. So that's why I would say, if you have the budget, you can partner with a consultant. I think that's great. Without a consultant, the one thing that you can do is what we talked about earlier is the conversation. It doesn't cost us anything to sit down to begin to talk. And this is again where your leaders come in because you have to be willing to lead the conversation around where do we have opportunities in our organization to grow and to progress. Um, many times we talk about DEI like it's a separate something from your business. But as Amy was mentioning earlier, diversity, equity, inclusion is a business strategy. So your business strategy already exists. So you sit down and now you're having a conversation around how can we be more diverse? How can we be more equitable? And how can we be more inclusive so that ultimately we get to belonging? So it doesn't cost us anything to have those conversations. There are various resources that are out there when you, Jonathan, when you talk about what's free. 
when we talk about educating yourselves, your leader shouldn't be the only one in the organization who's bringing knowledge and information. It has to be something that all of us are committed to. There's various resources that are out there, be that information on, uh, I call it Google Universe. Uh, you can always go out there, but you have organizations who are hosting free webinars and free seminars that your uh, leaders and employees can participate in. Um, there are those who um, want to talk about and strategize as an organization. So once you've had these conversations and you're talking about what you know makes sense for us to do, then again, we talked about a minute ago about having goals. Well, based on the goals of the organization, what we're trying to accomplish and where we see have opportunity, what, where can we begin to work on some things? And so how do we build in some accountability and have some focus groups that every now and then we're checking ourselves um, based on what we've learned um, and how we're trying to move forward? That's a place to start. Um, and I think from there you gain a lot of insight. Uh, and as your resources um, increase, meaning your financial resources, it's good to partner on some different efforts uh, with the consultant, even if the consultant doesn't do all of it. Many things, many times we saw that consultants came in and helped a lot of clients perform their initial assessments where they assess their works, their workforce. And therefore, they then provided Analyst, they provided um, an analysis of that data and gave recommendations. So if you have a small budget and you can at least get an assessment done and get feedback, that's great. But with or without it, you can get data from your workforce, which will then help you understand where to start and get you on the right road. And also just to add to that, Sonia, I was also mm -hmm. thinking about, um, you know, partnering with the leader, you know, who are focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion to mm -hmm. ask about is a budget, can there be a budget? Because sometimes you would even think that by just asking about kind of what's available, that could therefore start the conversations in terms of how to create a budget. Like even right now at Connect RN, that's something that we're doing right now in terms of our DEI committee and in our ERGs, which I'll talk about, you know, in our next question about how to even get that set up. But that's also something to do is partnering with the leaders and asking about what's available and, and how to um, do that as well. Right. And when you've had those internal conversations and you've been able to identify some areas where you might be might need some improvement, that's also where you can do a little research of your own. Talking to your leader about allowing you the opportunity to to research, uh, do some benchmarking to find, you know, what what would that cost? And if you could bring it back to them, uh, what would they approve? Where do they have, you know, some flexibility in the budget, but certainly open up those conversations. Exactly. Amy, is there anything that you'd like to add as well? Yeah, I mean, I'm also, I'm thinking that you definitely can take some time um, for not much expense, um, really taking a look at your sourcing and your recruiting too. So as you start to grow, things start to change. And we work with a lot of um, often smaller organizations that have grown fast, right? And I was just talking to it, um, one of my clients the other day and they were saying, you know, we really want to be thinking about our sourcing. We look around and everyone kind of looks the same and has a similar background. Everyone's kind of from the same college um, and so on. And that's how we grew and how we developed as a company. But we want to be different and we want to be more inclusive and diverse. And, and so talking about some of those steps, and again, it's sometimes the intentionality around looking at your networks and how people are coming in and what resources that you can use and what networks you can tap into um, to really start to change that landscape, you know? Um, even thinking about things like how you're talking about your jobs and your job descriptions and the language that you're using um, and how you know potential candidates are understanding that and viewing that. So that's, that's the big one, you know, interviewing. You know, thinking about what kind of questions you're asking. What are you not asking? Who's who's asking? You know, who's on these, you know, um, interview groups and committees, even if it's just a couple of people um, as you're getting going, who's part, who's a part of that? So that's, that's all very important. And that can be things that you can be doing um, for little to no, you know, cost with that. Um, that's, I think, some of the big ones, I'd say. And Jonathan, can I clarify one thing? I always like yes. to make this point when we're talking about recruiting, because I think this is a misconception. <laughs> yes, about, yes, go ahead. 
And I know you can amen me on this one. Okay, Definitely. let's be clear. When we talk about diverse hiring, because this is a big conversation, no, we are not focused on, okay, I need to hire two black people, two yellow people, two green people, two purple people. We're not doing that. It's not about quotas and it's not about reverse discrimination. When we talk about where are you sourcing, with the example that Amy gave, oftentimes when we're starting our businesses, we're using our families, we're using like that initial network. However, we then say, if you are going to expand your candidate pool, then you should look at where are you sourcing? So if you expand your sources that are tapping into more diverse groups of people, then it increases your opportunity to have more diverse representation in your candidate pool of qualified candidates. And then based on your criteria, what you're looking for, your interview and all of that, then you determine who comes into your organization. But it's about how do we increase representation in the people that we are considering, which ultimately increases our opportunity to pr bring more diversity in more, more diverse groups into the organization. Yes. And one, one more point I want to make too on that. Oh, go ahead. Hey, people, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, people will say, um, I want to hire a diverse candidate, right? You'll hear that all the time. First of all, a candidate is not diverse, right? One candidate is not diverse. <laughs> so a group of, a group of people is diverse. So that's what diversity is. It's the mix of, of, you know, of individuals. It's not it's not ever one person. person. So I just wanted to make that point because it's something I hear a lot. So I just wanted to. <laughs> and, and it's interesting too, because I would like to make another point too. I think it's also understanding too that sometimes depending upon where you're located in terms of city, sometimes also can be representing how much of a diverse talent is available. And even now, as I'm a talent acquisition partner here, I connect our and DE&I is one of my focuses. You know, one of the, the problems or not even problems, but some of the, sometimes it can be a problem is that finding a diverse, diverse talent in, depending upon the city or where, where you're locating or where that, that is. And it can sometimes um, affect or minimize how much diverse talent is out there. So it's not even the fact that the company doesn't want the diverse talent, it's more the diverse talent's not even available. So then there becomes the question of, well, how do we increase more of opportunities to hire more diverse pool of candidates. And so sometimes as companies, and this is something even that I've expressed to my company too in my efforts is that sometimes maybe maybe you have to think about in terms of, okay, if it's an office position, maybe you have to go hybrid. Sometimes you may have to even go remote and thinking about how that can also impact as well, increasing the pool of, of having a pool of diverse candidates as well. So also it's also thinking about kind of changing those strategies. And sometimes that doesn't even require a budget. That just means that you just having the data to support the reasoning. And therefore, the leadership team will kind of say that maybe this is this something that we need to think about as well. So just wanted to make that point as well, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of um, talking about kind of, you know, as we're still talking about DE9 and a budget in terms of some few, uh, in terms of some entry level initiatives. And so, Amy, I'm going to... Um, passes to you this question in terms of, and can you talk a little bit about kind of some entry level initiatives that people can do to create and maintain a DEI strategy that really doesn't require a lot of dollars at all? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think any way that you can, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but be able to receive feedback, you know, creating feedback loops so that you're able to hear um, and really be able to take in the perspectives and experiences of employees is important. And there are different ways that you can do that. Um, you know, having sessions where you're, you know, um, kind of a, a check-in session, you could have a, um, a survey if you wanted. Uh, these are ways that you can kind of pulse check to and see how are people doing? How are they feeling? Right. Um, and, and so on. So I think also another thing you can be, be doing is thinking about your, you know, how we're talking about celebrating things that are going on. So maybe holidays, for example, thinking about, um, you know, months and weeks that are significant. Uh, we're in Hispanic Heritage Month right now. This is, you know, this is something um, that we can be celebrating and talking about and sharing stories, storytelling. You know, um, one of my organizations that I work closely with have really st started a, a new initiative and it's you know, just an opportunity for them to talk about their backgrounds, their experiences, their families and, and their origins and so on. 
And it's been really interesting and inspiring. And it's a way that people get to know one another, you know, beyond just what they're doing. You know, sometimes we we check into our meetings, we sit down, we get going and and that's it. Right. We're not getting to understand people's experiences and getting to understand where they're coming from in new and different ways. That's easy to do. You know, I think, you know, even thinking about our meetings and our protocols, how are how are we starting off our meetings? Are we just getting right down to it? Are we saying, you know, tell me about how are things going? It sounds simple. Right. It sounds like a no brainer, but I, it, it's something that uh, in our busy world we can forget. And we can forget that human aspect that really contributes to that sense of belonging. Um, even on one-on-ones, kind of our check-in meetings with our, with our teams and with our supervisors and managers. You know, being able to talk about, you know, what's something that's, that went really well this week or this month? And what are you struggling with? What are your biggest challenges? How can I support you? What do you, what do you need from me? What do you think about X? And really being able to, to welcome that and encouraging it. So not just allowing it and saying, well, we'll allow, you know, we allow if you have a thought to be able to, to send it, you know, to this email or something. But in, in, in person, you know, being able to, um, you know, create and establish those relationships. These, I guess, small, in a sense, can be, uh, you know, strategies can be really, really impactful. Um, you know, again, I think ongoing education, and that can look very different for different organizations. Um, you know, we do a lot of training, which is, uh, you know, part of our work with our clients, and that is wonderful and a huge part of their, I think, educational journeys. But there's also types of things that we can we can build in. So thinking about, you know, a shared book or an article or movie that people are watching, we're talking about the significance of, um, you know, thinking about speakers, again, drawing from your own employees and your own staff to be able to talk about this and build upon this. Um, you've got, you, you know, you've got such great um, human resources when it comes to to this. And as, you know, as, as leaders, um, I think if you are a leader, you're in a position to be able to model that. And I think that's really, really important to be able to model and share that and tell your own story. Uh, so those, I mean, those are some areas. I think also, you know, thinking about what you believe and value and working through that as a working group and coming up with a DE&I statement that is true and authentic and you. Um, sometimes organizations will say, can you send me the DE&I statement or something like that? And I'm like, well, no, this is a process that we want to work with you on to help you to develop this and create something that is yours and something you can stand behind and your employees get. And they say, yes, this is us and we're proud of this and this is our commitment. So that's just a few, a few ideas. Yeah. Excellent. And, and no, I was just saying, Amy, those are some excellent, excellent um, initiatives that people can do. And also just to add on to what you were saying, also, I know we had talked about ERGs. And so just to give a quick little story. So... Our, the, our company, um, Connect RN, um, had, and it, it sometimes it's all about kind of like having an idea and kind of just going with it, right? And kind of talking to the right people in terms of having that idea initiated. So when you think about ERGs, right? ERGs are an amazing way to create and maintain a DIC strategy that doesn't require a lot of dollars. Why? Because they're usually led by the employees of the company. And all it takes is just for somebody to just say, I'm interested in doing this and creating this space. And so a couple months ago, you know, and I've only been at my company for seven months, but I said, you know, to, you know, the CEO, I said, you know, we have three ERGs here. I think it would be great to have a black ERG. And I feel like this is something we need. And just because of that discussion or that conversation I had turned into now, so Jonathan, what do you think about co-leading this? And I was like, uh, I don't know about that, but maybe we'll think about that. And then it turned into having conversations with the DEI committee and, and, and some of our leaders. And then all of a sudden, two and a half, three months later, I'm now the co-lead of the Connectors of Black Excellence. And so just because of me just having the thought and connecting with leaders and, and having the drive and felt like this was important to make sure that Black employees were um, represented and creating that safe and supportive environment, 
now I'm leading an a ERG. And of course, it's something that's a lot of work, but I'm just thankful that the company even seeing me as somebody as an emerging leader to want to take this on. And so even just providing those opportunities and, and letting people know that these things are important, you'd be surprised how many of people even in your own organization would be interested in doing something like that. So just wanted to make that point as well. Um, so now that you talk about initiatives, you know, we had kind of talked about earlier about kind of working hybrid and working remote, right? This is the state we are in right now, <laughs> a lot of us. And so, Sonia, this question will be for you in terms of kind of how do you incorporate, you know, hybrid or remote model workplaces into DEI programming without dramatically increasing your budget? The magic word was stated by Amy earlier, it's intentionality. When you begin to think about your programs, you always have to think about, when we talk about the inclusivity piece, how do I include all of my employees in this particular effort? And consider where they're located. Um, my team is hybrid. I have one employee we've never met in person. Uh, she's on the team. Uh, I think I'm meeting her next month, finally face to face. Um, but when her first day came, and I'll just give an example of how this could work. So on her first day, she was going to be located in our sales office in California. And I contacted one of the district, the district manager at that location, and we coordinated. And so he assisted with her having what we call an insperity experience her first day. So there was someone there to meet and greet her, although I was not there in person. Um, and then her onboarding plan, and let's be intentional about onboarding new employees. So we had a plan as a team for how we were going to help her acclimate to our team, to Insperity, how we were going to partner with those in her location to help with that onboarding process. And then how was she going to move into her role when we got past some of the, you know, how you have to learn about the company, get your compliance, all that out of the way. But we planned for that. And so intentionality, intentionality is very important. And don't forget to ask those who are in a hybrid situation or remote how they feel they can contribute to what's going on. Um, and I don't know if you all have picked up on the theme also that you hear throughout this conversation. It's about effective communication, effective communication and keeping the communication lines open. That's very huge when you have hybrid and remote employees. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'd say also being aware of, um, you know, timing of it's, it sounds simple, but uh, when you're scheduling things, are you scheduling something where someone has to be at the meeting at six in the morning and someone has to be at the meeting at 10 at night? And so being aware of that to the extent that you can, um, I think is really important. And also, I, I, I think with the hybrid, um, when, we're, when we're online, we're on Zoom or whatever it might be, you 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 lose a little bit of the the body language. You may you may, may not be able to tell always um, you know how someone might be feeling or experiencing. So I think it's important to to note you know if people are quiet, note if they're not usually you know not to be able to invite people in to some of those remote conversations too. So um, so that they have that sense of inclusion, especially if they're um, maybe not one to to be the first to speak um, or be the loudest. Uh, it's important to take note of too. And just another example real quick, Jonathan, I know I'm sorry to interrupt. Nope. I was going to no, say, no. I, even think about, I was thinking about a situation with Amy. Uh, we had a couple of people in Kingwood in our Houston office and we were all in the office and we were having this brainstorm about this formula we were trying to figure out and it wasn't coming together. And we finally had an aha moment. And the only person who wasn't in the room wasn't Amy. So we paused. We was like, okay, we need to have an instant Zoom. She has to be here. And we had the laptop holding it up so she could see what was going on the whiteboard or whatever. But we pulled her in in that moment. So that's what I mean by you have to be intentional. You have to think outside of the box about how do you pull your people into those various experiences. No, that's a great point, Sonia. And just to add on to your point, I'm also thinking about kind of flexibility, right? And making sure that we give employees the flexibility to, in order to, you know, provide opportunity. And so just to give an example of that, you know, at our company, you know, we have something called chat and chills and lunch and learn. Those are great opportunities. Okay. Those are great opportunities that don't increase your budget at all. It gives opportunities to the employees to, you know, talk about DEI issues or anything DEI focused. And it gives them the opportunity for them to kind of have a spotlight and bring more awareness and create conversation. 
So whether you are hybrid, whether you're remote, anyone can do it. Now, of course, the tough thing about that is sometimes you cannot get everybody as many people as you can to come to one of those sessions. Why? Because everybody's busy in their day to day. But I do think that to give people those opportunities to, you know, talk about different issues that are important to them and then also use like maybe like a company meeting or platform to um, promote those events. So therefore, everybody in the company knows when they are. I think it's a great way, you know, for to give shine to employees, to provide flexibility and to do that in a very effective way that doesn't cost anything. I love that. I love that. And I, and I think as we can think about that, um, you know, having that platform, even for when things are, things are go wrong in the world and we've had, we've all experienced, I mean, a lot of hard things and really difficult days and having a space and a place, you know, we talked to a lot of employees who will say, Oh, it's nice to have a, a place to be able to just like, just talk about what's going on and how we're feeling about that because this happened yesterday, but now it's today and we're all here at work and it feels funny that no one's talking about what just happened or whatever it may be. So having that space and sometimes it can be more, it can be lighter and, you know, and sometimes it might be really addressing something and pulling people together who might be in different parts of the country or the world, mm -hmm. you know, to experience, um, to be able to work with one another and help one another. Yeah. I think about Absolutely. one, I always interrupt you, Jonathan. I'm sorry. No, I was just saying absolutely, <laughs> Sonia. <You're fine. laughs> I was just going to give one other example about we have a client where the CEO, when she talks about his things happen in the world, he's intentional about hosting, opening a Zoom meeting with no agenda, making himself available for however his employees would like to come into that space with him, whether mm -hmm. it's to sit in silence, to share, to laugh, to talk, to cry with no judgment. And that's a mm -hmm. way he keeps himself connected with his employees in this time when they're all remote still. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right, Sonia. Um, so at this point, I know that we're running a little bit low on time. And so I definitely, we actually had gotten some questions in the chat. And I know maybe somebody in the audience in person may have some questions as well. So I just wanted to take maybe one or one question or two questions virtually, and then we can maybe take some questions if anyone has some in person. So um, the first question that we actually have is actually a pretty interesting one. Either one of you can take it. Um, can, you little, can you speak a little bit about how DEI and CSR are connected and strategic versus responsive DEI? Um, most companies, we have co CSR is corporate social responsibility. Um, and various, kind, well, let me back up. Companies have a report that they prepare um, that talks about how socially responsible they're being. So just so people understand your, the acronyms. And if I get it wrong for the person who asked the question, please you know, ask me to clarify or give me some more insight. Um, so when we talk about DE&I, I think we are looking at organizations are doing more of an internal look at themselves about how they're performing this in this area as we look at the fact that companies are becoming more socially responsible just based on where we are and how we've had this pivot in the business environment. So you will often see, and sometimes I say often, I don't know about all, I just know the ones that I've seen, even with our own corporate response, uh, social responsibility report, where they, are, where they will talk about uh, what they are doing in these spaces uh, to improve on their DEI. I think it's something that organizations are working toward if they're not there to ensure that their reporting is included in there. But certainly there is um, there's some alignment there um, when it comes to that. And the second part, the second part of the question was, or the second question was, Jonathan, can you repeat it? Yep. Second part of the question was, um, it was, can you speak a bit about to how DEI and CSR are connected in mm -hmm. strategic versus responsive DEI? Ah, strategic uh, DNI. It well, whether you are being proactive or reactive, diversity, equity, inclusion is a strategy. It's a business strategy, and it should be. Um, companies who are proactive are usually coming to us saying, "Hey, this is where we are. This is where we want to be," and so we work with them to define what that strategy is based on a number of steps that we have mentioned here earlier. Um, responsive is usually there. Is something has a but. When we oftentimes hear companies or people talk about responsive DEI, sometimes there has been something that has occurred in their organization that has now prompted them to feel like they need to take action in this space. Um, and what we have seen sometimes there is this 
checkbox mentality. Uh, we talked about training. You know, sometimes people think training is the answer to everything. So they want to throw training at it, um, highlight a couple of people in the company who may be a part of underrepresented groups and think they've arrived. And that's not what it is. It's, it's not about checking the boxes. It's about having a strategic plan in place that helps you embed it into your organization, taking a full look at your employee life cycle and how you are going to move through each part of that life cycle to ensure that it is embedded into your company culture. Thank you so much, Tanya, for answering that question. Um, another question I wanted to take from the virtual audience, and this actually was from Rita, and this actually is interesting, and Amy, I'll give this to you. This is about compensation, which is something that is, that is always very important. So the question is, Amy, are you compensating your staff who is on a DEI committee or task force, and or what tangible benefits are you giving them when you have a limited budget? Sure. So are you, are you compensating your task force is the, is the question, right? Exactly. Yeah, uh, typically you're you're not they're they're not compensated in terms of a financial reward. Um, it's usually a situation where employees want to be a part of it. Their supervisors and managers have also um, encouraged and uh, allowed their participation. And there are, I guess, there are other rewards to that necessarily. But you would you probably wouldn't want to um, to reward financially because there are just other you know, um, HR risks around that, um, where you wouldn't, but, you know, I think that, uh, for a lot of the councils we work with, you know, there are events that they're a part of, there are, you know, different types of, uh, activities that they're able to be a part of. They're able to, um, you know, really be able to talk about their involvement within the organization. And there are a lot of just sort of, um, other types of intrinsic rewards that are a part of it, but, um, for the most part. Good question. Uh, another point that I wanted to make too, and I'm thinking about it too, is like it, within a DEI committee, I think it's also very important to have a leadership team. And I think that leadership team to also be kind of involved in having conversations with the executive leadership team on DEI and then having some type of an impact in some way, shape or form. I know that's something that we have a connector in is like we have a DEI committee, but we have a president uh, or a vice president, a communications chair, a finance team, and that makes up the leadership team. And therefore, they actually have like conversations with the CE, you know, to talk about DE and I, to talk about the budget and the budget that's going to be in the ERGs. And I think that that's important because that's just kind of giving them some leadership and a voice when it comes to kind of impacting overall DE and I. And so even if there's not but no budget that can be given, I think just in terms of them still having an opportunity to kind of impact the business, mm -hmm. I think it's very important as well, too. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, does anyone have any questions in the audience? Because I definitely wanted to make sure that anyone had any questions in the audience. Yeah, if anyone has a question, feel free to raise your hand. And if not, one of the things that actually occurred to me just listening to the presentation was when we had initially started out, one of the first questions that Jonathan asked was in regard to if, you know, what sort of mistakes have you seen as people have tried to approach making this sort of an integral part of their business? If you are a business leader and you really have that period of introspection where you do realize that you have made those mistakes or that potentially policies that are in place might be harmful to employees in whatever way, be it, you know, intended or not, what advice would you give people that are in that seat in that moment of reckoning to say, you know, I, this isn't, this isn't what this was intended to be, or maybe we didn't get it right and we need to change. What would be maybe some actionable advice for folks in that, in that spot? When you were talking, my first thought was that very vulnerability right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a leader in my organization, I'd, be, I'd have to be able to say, hey, you know what? I think we missed the mark on this one. And this is where I think we missed the mark. And I want to reset and I want to refocus and I want voices. I want to pull people in who want to be a part of this conversation. I think that's where you begin to build trust with you, those who you lead about your intention and about how sincere you are in this space with it not just being a checkbox, but something you want to do. So I would say, again, it comes back to the communication, whether it's formal or informal, but first addressing it there and then taking a, a, making the space to sit down and talk about what should be those next steps to move forward. Mm -hmm. It sounds simple, but it really is yep. as simple as that. I keep doing it, Jonathan, sorry. <laughs> Okay. 
And is there anything that you'd like to add? It's like... <laughs> <laughs> um, I just that I think you know fear can can stop us from achieving so much, right? And I think there's fear that can be behind not starting. Number one. Um, we hear that sometimes and it's, well, I don't know. I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to get it wrong. So I'm just maybe not going to do it at all. And that is going back to a mistake. That is another mistake, but it can also keep people from, from making a pivot, from, from changing direction and from being transparent and communicating with employees when that's exactly what you want to do and what employees really want and need and respect. Right. So that's a great one. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions in the audience? I did see one come through actually on here. And this is, obviously this is a topic that has a lot of emotion and there's like a reverence and a weight to it. But one of the questions that someone had was in terms of maybe incorporating these themes in maybe a very approachable, um, maybe lighter way, what recommendations might you have? I know um, you had spoken about maybe books or movies or things like that. There's so much incredible literature and media coming out with these themes at the, at the center of it. So do you have any recommendations for folks that might be looking to incorporate that into maybe it's a lunch and learn or something like that, um, that really kind of breed a, a fruitful ground in terms of like thought and discourse? Yeah, I think that's can be a great place to start sometimes. Sometimes it's hard to, depending on the organization, it's hard to start up here when if people are, you know, kind of com comfortable getting to know one another still and really um, want to begin the journey. So I do, I think that um, we've seen a lot of success with people doing things like the Lunch and Learns. Um, we, you, you can invite a speaker in to be a part of that, um, but having shared, you know, conversation around, you know, even just questions that you pose, um, that can be a great way to spend that time. And you can get, you know, progressively, I guess, a little bit, a little bit deeper um, with some of your questions as you go. Um, if if that works, because I, I think that sometimes employees might, uh, depending on, again, the organization and the group, they might not feel as comfortable right away sharing everything maybe about themselves right away. I know Sonia has a point about this that we were, we were chatting about too, but I, I think that it's um, important to start with where you're at and go from there, books, movies, articles, um, things that are happening currently, like current events, and bringing that together um, is a great place to start, for sure. And I'll say this, and I keep doing it, Jonathan, but that's because we can't see each other. So um, when you talk, I, I think it's also about respect. When we talk, and I want to get back to when you talk about this being an emotional space. So um, I'll just share my own experience real quick. So when everything first happened um, with the murder of George Floyd, I had a lot of people coming to me because I tend to be a pretty open person. I just kind of talk. However, it required me to go to a place personally to share some of my own experiences. So as you start talking to people about how they have been impacted in their workplaces. So I think about as a black woman in corporate America, I have covered for many, many years in a lot of different ways. I was just having a conversation uh, with someone the other day about, uh, for those of you who can't tell this and didn't meet me before you walked in, I'm sitting down now, I'm six feet tall and with shoes on, I'm six two because I usually wear a heel. And then um, we have the bias of about the angry black woman. So I've always had to be mindful of my approach and my presence and you know, and, and so much of me and so much of what people call negative is also cultural. So I really had to work on that. So for people to then ask me to start unlayering about what all I have had to leave at the door that makes me authentically who I am and walk in and leave those parts of me was very difficult. So when you have these conversations, sometimes you will see that people will get um, emotional. Well, I've been in my career for over 20 years now. So I've had 20 years of like basically leading a double life. And what I mean by that is I can't bring all of me into the workplace before this big pivot came in a lot of places because there's a certain bias and certain things that come. And, you know, I wear my hair natural now where I've 
you know, when I started my career and sitting at a lot of tables, it wasn't necessarily um, spoken to, spoken around, dismissed. So I just say that because it is an emotional space and you see a lot of emotion, know that it's not always directed at you personally. It's people dealing with whatever those experiences have been and how they have shown up. Um, can I share our story? Absolutely. I'm not sure which one it is, but I'm sure it's a good one. <laughs> well, we talk about how everybody comes into this space and how we all have a lot of responsibility. We're clearly Amy is a white female. Well, in this space, people feel like, well, how can a white female tell me anything about DEI? Mm -hmm. And I, and it's in, <laughs> Jonathan's like, mm hmm, because we do, we hear that. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a perfect example of how it takes all of us because. Her experiences may not be my experiences, but she does have experiences. And based on the fact that DEI is a business strategy, and based on her background, she can marry the two, and she can be a consultant in this way. But th so we have had people who who get into sessions with us, and they want to dismiss and hear her, dismiss and not hear from her, and defer to me. Well, now that's when I become her ally, because you're not going to dismiss this professional. And this person on my team who I value, but I need to help you understand how she also brings value in this space. So again, it is a very emotional work, um, but we have to learn how to work through that. And then again, I say be empathetic with people, be patient with people and extend grace in the space because as people work through some of their experiences, there will be emotion involved. There will, and there is, and we see this and live this every day. Um, but it's such important work. And it's so important to be allies for one another too, right? And that's that's what we're talking about is how can we be allies and how can we support one another in, in what you're doing and, um, and be asking, asking too, what's helpful and how can I, how can I help is important and always remembering that. And, and, you know, we can all be allies in different spaces too, in different places based on our dimensions. Maybe in one way, maybe not, you know, can be a little harder. In other ways, um, we may be in a position where you say, you know, based on, you know, the, this fact about me and my, my diversity, my dimensions of diversity, I can be a really active ally for, for people. And remembering that, that it, we all can in different ways and for one another. So. And another point that I wanted to make too with Amy in terms of what you said is that I think I also think about giving back, right, to the community, right? It's very important. I know that we all like to give back to the community. And one thing I always think about every day, you know, as being an African American male is that there's not a lot of African Americans in the tax space currently. And so the thing is, one thing I always think about is how do we, how do we spread more awareness to individuals that are behind me, you know, in terms of who are in college and to expose them to let them see that this is something, this is an industry that they can break into. Because if you think about it, you're not taught in college how to be in tech. It's something that you just figure out. And always, I always think about how do we create more opportunities for individuals to be in this space. And so one thing that, you know, we're doing now, you know, as um, for Kobe is that we're actually in the process of of doing this right now is we're actually going to do a career fair where we're going to bring high school students and college students on um, and doing it virtually to have them be exposed on what is tech and that a lot of them have a lot of transferable skills that could have them have an opportunity in this industry whether they want to be in finance human resources engineering there's all these different opportunities but people just don't understand kind of what opportunities are available so in terms of giving back and giving back to your communities and doing that and fostering that in an important way i think it's so huge and that's one that I'm a firm believer as well, too. <laughs> that's great. Awesome. With that, I think we're at about time. So 